Welcome to Cybersecurity Compliance Framework and System Administration. Hi, I'm Franklin Almonte, a course developer for IBM's data security portfolio. I will be with you through this course to help tie together the material you need to develop your skills to be successful as a junior cybersecurity analyst. You will be taught by IBM cybersecurity experts who will take you through four modules covering compliance framework and system administration, as well as important aspects of cryptography and encryption. All these lessons are designed to help you understand the important processes and frameworks implemented within your organization. In Module 1, you will learn about cybersecurity compliance frameworks and industry standards recommended or required for organizations to implement to protect and defend critical data. You will explore relevant laws, including the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, or CFAA. The IBM team will take you through data protection regulations, including GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, and industry-specific regulations like HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, as well as PCI DSS, the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, which is an information security standard for organizations that issue credit cards or process credit card payments. As you learn about cybersecurity, it is important to review the Information Security Management Systems, ISMS, standards, ISO 27000, family of standards, helps organizations keep information assets secure. Lastly, we will take you through two sets of security controls, the CIS critical security controls, which are a recommended set of actions for cyber defense that provide specific and actionable ways to stop today's most pervasive and dangerous attacks. And the NIST SP800-53 database, which represents the security controls and associated assessment procedures. This module has a lot of information around standards and compliance, but I will be here to help you navigate through the lessons in this module. We have also included a glossary within module one that you can refer to throughout this course. Are you ready to get started? I'll see you on the flip side. In this video, you will learn to describe the challenges organizations face which require compliance and regulation. Oh, welcome, my name is Katherine Franklin. I'm Program Director for Compliance and Audit Readiness at IBM in the Cloud and Cognitive Software Division. So today we're gonna to be talking about different topics associated with compliance and regulation for cybersecurity. There are a number of different compliances and uh, standards and laws, and we'll try to detangle some of that for you and give you some places to start as you consider these topics for your own uh, purposes. So first off, let's get some definitions set. We have different types of security um, definitions. We have security events, attacks, and incidents. And they are all slight, they're all related, but they're different. A security event is a system or network detected by a security device or an application. So this can be any normal activity from um, you know, entering a password, that's a security event. Uh, it can be a firewall rule check, that's a security event. It's not the same as an attack. An uh, attack, of course, is a subset of the events, and that's when you actually have some entity or tool or person attempting to do something malicious um, or untoward with your system. It can be uh, trying to collect data, corrupt your system, create a denial of uh, service, uh, destroy your system, anything like that. That any attempt of that is an attack. Uh, an incident then is when uh, IBM and and the world at large would consider it something um, worthy of deeper investigation. So we think that possibly something bad actually happened. So we had the attack, which was the attempt, and we had the incident, which means we think maybe something actually had happened, uh, and we need to go and figure out what happened and what we're going to do about it. So the challenge for security is that, of course, there's so many of these events, right? You're always entering your password. There's always something that's checking something else. Uh, this is a report from the um, 2015 Cyber Intelligence Index from IBM, and they identified in the cloud space that there are roughly 82 million events 
in, in 2014, of which 12,000-ish uh, represented an actual attack and 100 represented uh, an incident. And this would be for an individual system. Um, I think a big misnomer that our big misconception people have is that uh, their systems are somehow safe because they're not seeing things. Well, probably you're not seeing things because you have firewall rules and other activities that are in place and they block a lot of that for you. So what you're really seeing is the distilled um, things that you're actually concerned about. But the main objective is how to put in the um, security controls that you need to um, for all of these events so that you can find, prevent, and protect against the attacks and the incidences. Well, there's no one way that you protect a system. There's hundreds of different ways that people will attempt to um, maliciously uh, attack your system. There are, um, so you need multiple different facets and approaches. So again, look at the same study, 2014, they looked at the different sources or types of uh, security attacks that were identified. We have unauthorized access, malicious code, uh, sustained probes and scans, um, access credentials, denial of service, right? So you can see a whole list there of uh, different ways that people are, uh, that, that attacks break down into different categories. And even who your bad guys are, that breaks down into main categories. You can see about 45% of all bad guys are outsiders. They are not part of your business, they are not part of your environment, but they are trying to get in. These are the hackers of the world, these are the, um, uh, they can be individuals, they can be organized crime, they can be uh, a number of different sources. Um, the other 55% represent insiders. These are people that may be working in your own organization. You know, you think, okay, I know and I trust everybody, but the truth of the matter is that some folks are um, in your organization may become uh, dissatisfied over time, and so you'll see a number of malicious insiders. You can also see inadvertent actors on the inside, right? So these inadvertent actors are people that have access to your systems as part of their normal days and functions, and we're human, they make mistakes. So we need security protocols and controls and tooling and processes in place to try to address the different types of security incidences we can have, as well as the different sources they can come from. You get tired of entering your password every day, all day, all the time. Well, it's there for a reason. It's there to make sure that you have, like they all have a purpose, each one of these things. And it's not about having any one security protocol in place to help you, but about having a set of them to address the different scenarios. So think about this. You've got an outsider. He wants to get in. They want, the outsider wants to get in. They want to steal your data. They want to steal your compute time. They want to disrupt your legitimate use of your, of your, of your products, of your services. You've got to look at different techniques specifically addressed for them. You're looking at encryption. You're looking at um, uh, you're looking at firewalls. Uh, you want to validate these through reviews, through tests, through threat models, penetration testing. There's lots of different ways you're going to and deal with that particular actor. The inadvertent actor are on the inside, but are human. They're making mistakes. You want to want to make sure there that you have systems in place and procedures to reduce error-related controls. You're going to be prompting for um, confirmation of things. You're going to be looking for automation to reduce human data entry errors. And so you're going to look at different sorts of uh, automation and reports and things like that to try to, to prevent those things from happening. The malicious insider, they're inside, but they're deliberately behaving badly. So there you want to make sure you focus on things like separation of duties. You want to make sure you have a limited privileged IDs, you want to limit the access to your critical systems, your critical data to just the fewest people possible, reduces the risk that those people are malicious. And uh, you want to make sure you have individual accountability, so no shared user IDs, and you're logging and monitoring whatever that those limited IDs are actually performing, and you're reviewing that on a regular basis. In this video, you will learn to Describe the difference between security and compliance. Describe the specific checklist of security controls. So we're going to go through 
some compliance basics. So the previous talk was mostly focused on security, but we're going to go through compliance basics at this point. And what we're looking here is really understanding some of the differences between security and privacy and compliance and how that is going to unfold as we look at uh, different compliance standards and regulations. So security, privacy, compliance, they're all related, but they're not actually the same thing. Security is designed to focus on uh, protecting your environment and your systems from theft, from damage, from disruption, from misdirection. It comes in three main categories. There are physical controls. So how do you physically keep your systems that you're operating your, your applications on uh, contained, right? There's, so there's servers and data centers. They may be in the cloud. How do you ensure the physical uh, security of the hardware. Then there's technical controls. Technical controls are tooling or software or features and functions um, that restrict or control the security of the data or the processes. So you can think of encryption. You can think of logging. Uh, you can think of password software. All of those are examples of technical controls. Operational controls are more the procedural. These are how a server is configured. What are your rules for how often you patch a system? Who's responsible for monitoring the logs and reviewing them? How your staff are trained and what activities they perform? These are operational or procedural controls. So the security of your system isn't going to be addressed with just one defense. It's going to have many, and they typically fall into one of those three categories. Privacy is a little bit different. Privacy is strongly focused on the data. So how the information is being used, who has access to it, how is it stored, how is it transferred, is the, in what, how that information may be used to track people um, or things, or, uh, and that is privacy about you as an individual, for example. Compliance focuses on testing the security measures are in place or the privacy measures are in place. Compliance will typically identify a specific subset of all of the controls based on a particular goal. And then the idea is you validate those specific controls to that standard. So this will, um, it can also cover a lot of non-security uh, things that you wouldn't typically think of as security. So business practices, vendor agreements, uh, you don't typically may think of vendor agreements as something related to um, security, but certainly if you, you don't build your product and run your product on your own, you have vendors that participate with you, you need to ensure that they're providing the, the security and privacy controls that you're expecting of them. So it's related, um, but maybe indirectly for some people's perspective. So compliance, when you think about compliance, as I said, depending on how you articulate security requirements or individual requirements. There can be anywhere from 50 to 500 controls out there that are involved in securing your, your environment, your system, your product, your, your, um, your application. So depending on which compliance you're going after, you may be choosing a specific subset of that 500. Uh, so once you've identified that, you're going to want to validate. Uh, they would validate on a schedule Typically, you would validate that with either an external auditor or another assessor inside your own company. We, we have assessors inside IBM who perform that function. Um, and then we're looking at sort of proving out that those controls are being adhered to and are in place. Um, sometimes, depending on the nature of the particular compliance, it's, um, it's well, worthwhile to consider having an external uh, vendor who specializes in that particular compliance. They come in and they do um, a, a, an assessment. They can do an, an audit. They can do uh, the standards. will each govern whether the, what they're doing is, a, is an assessment, um, uh, an audit, or a report, or a certification. So it, that terminology is all kind of particular to the individual compliance. We're going to go through some of those in a little bit later. Compliances, there's really two main categories for compliances. So what you'll see from compliances is some are foundational, they're general, they're not specific to any particular industry, 
They are broad spectrum. They go over a number of different topics, be it physical or the uh, technical or the operational. Um, examples like that would be ISO 27001, um, SOC, which we'll get into in a bit. And then there are other classifications that are more industry specific or governmental even, and they are particular to a specific subject matter. So an example is what we'll see here later today. We've got HIPAA, which focuses on US healthcare. We have PCI DSS, which focuses on payment card information, so credit card data storage. And, uh, and there's European standards. Uh, many jurisdictions will have, the US federal government has several standards. Uh, so we'll be going through some of those as part of this, this conversation. Um, and you as a, as, a, as a security cyber specialist would want to understand kind of when and how each of these apply uh, and what's appropriate for your business because that's where you're going to want to um, order up, right? These are all, some of these are very expensive to do. You have to choose the ones that are most appropriate to your industry, most appropriate to your business needs and, and focus on the, um, going after the ones that will uh, provide you the, the greatest business value. Typical compliance process for initially getting that certification or that compliance, um, you want to establish the scope. So uh, if we want to go after ISO, I want to go after it for this particular set of systems, this particular application, this particular environment. So you want to establish the scope, very clear boundaries of what is in your compliance and what is not. The readiness assessment. You go through all of the compliance requirements for that particular standard. You look at the controls. You look at the specific subset of the 50 to 500. Uh, you want to understand how each of those controls applies to your environment that you've established scope on. Then you want to assess how well do you perform that function. I perform that function well. I don't perform that function at all. I perform it eh, sort of, but not great. So you'll identify gaps as part of that readiness assessment. Once you've identified the list of gaps, then you've got some homework to do, right? You wanna go and you wanna address those gaps. You wanna remediate any findings that you've had so that you've made corrections. So if you don't have encryption everywhere that you want to have encryption according to the standard, well, then you'll go and you'll add it. If you haven't got um, the, uh, if you haven't got your user IDs, you haven't got the individual uh, least privilege, maybe you wanna go through and review who has access to your system and trim that up. So you'll go through that gap remediation and then you'll enter a testing period. If you're testing it through your self-assessment or internal assessment, you'll work with experts in that area. You may also be engaging external auditors if that's the appropriate thing. Once the testing is completed, whatever certification or assertion or reporting is usually follows some period of time after that. It can take some period of time to finish off the reports and testing. Uh, then you'll be recertifying. Right? So depending on the nature of the certification, sometimes you're recertifying quarterly, recertifying annually, biannually. It, it really is going to depend on the, the terms of the particular certification you're going after, but they all generally fit this mold. If you found yourself partway through testing and found out maybe that you didn't complete your gaps appropriately enough, you may be circling back to the beginning and reestablishing your scope or redoing your gap re uh, remediation. And basically, though, you'll be cycling in this for the lifetime that you intend to support that particular compliance. In this video, you will learn to describe the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. So we're going to talk now about a few specific different topics in U.S. federal law and different compliances going forward. So we'll get into some specific examples and talk a little bit about them. First one we're going to talk about is in the U.S. federal law space, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. So the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act has been around since 1984. It basically is what makes it a crime to perform a, uh, that makes cyber crime a crime. So it is a law that identifies that access to a computer without authorization with, uh, or in excess of your authorization is against the law. It is against the law to interfere. It is against the law to um, acquire, to disrupt uh, your systems. And it's punishable. So it's a act that uh, prior to 1984, 
computers were in use, of course, but um, they fell under uh, the standard mail and wire fraud rules. But now, it's, 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 since 1984, it's been a separate law. There are other US federal laws, uh, FISMA and FedRAMP, that uh, look at assigning specific responsibilities to federal agencies. If you do business with the US federal government, you will have um, to be supporting uh, very strong physical requirements, technical requirements. Each agency within the US federal government can have a different subset of standards that they need to have met uh, as part of this. And uh, so you end up with a, um, this one is very complex. And my, my advice to you is if you're going down the US federal law space, like this will be a devoted topic in and of itself, an entire research project for, from an education standpoint as well as acquiring it. But they all, these US federal laws will base their subset of their requirements off of something called NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. In this video, you will learn to describe the importance of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. The National Institute of Standards and Technology is uh, focused on cybersecurity and privacy. They will identify literally hundreds of individual standards. Uh, that are related. There'll be pages and pages of details on passwords, on encryption, on uh, network communications, and how to assure um, security and privacy. There's not generally an expectation that you will implement all many, many hundreds of these things, but that you'll institute a practice within your, in your business to do as many of them as makes sense for your business. And as I said earlier, depending on which agency you're working with, they will have specific subsets that they'll be looking for. In this video, you will learn to describe the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, describe the key privacy and data protection requirements of GDPR. GDPR, or the General Data Protection and Regulation uh, Laws, are a European standard that are that came out recently. Uh, they are laws governed at privacy of European data. So they focus on compliance, data protection, and personal data of EU residents in particular. So if your business is going to host EU resident data or do business with the EU, then this is an important uh, regulation for you to understand. So from a compliance perspective, they're looking at uh, regulating how you manage the data associated with people, having to sure you have policies and processes in place. Um, they're specifically looking at data encryption, data security, access and monitoring to data, a lot of, and then um, personal data, a lot in the privacy area, and how to ensure that uh, the data is there lawfully. You also see laws here around the right to forget. They also come with incredibly stiff penalties. So it's been around since uh, 2018. As I said, it applies to anybody in the world, regardless, as long as you're doing, as long as the data that you're working on is European, it is going to be a law for you. Fines can be huge, 4% or up to 20 million euros, depending on your, uh, your company's revenue. Uh, you can Google GDPR findings and you'll see that they have some serious fines attached to them. We've seen multi-million, we've seen, I've seen fines in excess of 100 million euros. So the five key tenants there are the rights of data uh, management for EU subjects, the security of that personal data, the requirement to obtain consent from the owners of that data, we'll get into that a little bit, and the accountability and the data protection. So key terms here that you'll want to understand is the data subject. That's the identified or, identified or identifiable natural living person. So that's the EU resident. The controller, this is the person who is or entity that is responsible for the handling of that data. And the processor. And the processor could be an actor on behalf of the controller that is processing the data. So if you're, um, uh, let's say, a bank, would be considered a controller. 
But if you were providing an application to the bank and the bank was running your application, you would be a processor. So personal data is any information related to the subject. So this is something that's often misunderstood. They think that uh, if it's somehow uh, detached from identifying the person, uh, it's still personal data. The processing is any person performing that data or any entity performing that data, that's storage, that's access, that's transfer. And as I said earlier, it's global, it's anywhere in the world. So uh, the law governs the data, not physically where the data is. In this video, you will learn to describe the basics of the ISO 27001 standards. ISO. We're going to spend some time looking at ISO 27000 family of standards. ISO, of course, has many different standards, but the ones in particular that we're interested in here are the ones that are applicable for cybersecurity. It, this one particularly focuses on information assets. 27001 is the most common one. It is a, an information and security management standard. The, it, it focuses on requirements for establishing and implementing, maintaining, and improving your security management system. It's risk-based, so it's looking at the risk it, and the maturity level of your organization. So great that you have password protection. Do you have password protection? Um, what is the complexity of your password protection? Right. So that as you increase the complexity um, standard associated with, with what you're implementing, that's how you move up the maturity level. There are others in the family. There are many in the family, the ones that are relevant for our conversation today. We look at 27,018, which is focused on privacy, and 27,017, which is focused on cloud security. Of course, that's my background in cloud. We use a combination of these three security standards as part of our comfort and assurance that we are able to meet requirements of things like GDPR. We would hire external auditors who would come in and assess and provide us certifications in this space. So the certification process provides credibility to our clients that we are achieving the standards expected. The advantage of an external auditor coming in and doing that assessment, we can provide that report, is then the clients aren't required to go and do individual assessments. They can look at the report, they can look at who performed it, they can look at the terms of that, and they can say, yeah, that's as, that's as good a standard as testing as I would have done. And it can really help you because you can provide that one standard to many clients rather than have clients perform individual assessments. There are some industries, some jurisdictions, some situations where the certification or having it is actually a legal or contractual requirement. So if you want to do business in certain geographies, you'll either have to do uh, an individual audit or you have to be able to provide it. ISO does develop standards, but they don't themselves issue the certification. You find a authorized, qualified, accredited certifier or auditor to come in and perform that assessment on your behalf. And then uh, you would have a certificate. Typically, you get a certificate, and that certificate is something that you would put on your website and, and shout loud and proud because it demonstrates uh, a lot of hard work, identifies a standard um, that is uh, you know, attractive to your customers. In this video, you will learn to describe the differences between SOC1, SOC2, and SOC3 controls, describe the benefits of SOC reports, SOC reports. So we'll spend some time now looking at SOC reports. So SOC reports are uh, secure, uh, the, uh, some industries will require it, just like we mentioned earlier for ISO. Some, um, some jurisdictions or industries would require it. In, and if you don't have it, they'll accept, uh, you, you have to perform some local uh, compliance audit. So many organizations who know compliance actually prefer SOC 2 over ISO. Uh, ISO is a point in time testing, whereas a SOC 2 is a continuously monitored testing over a period of time. So, um, and again, some organizations or some clients or some industries will accept SOC 2 in lieu of the right to audit. Right. So, if I could compare with ISO and I look at the different types of things that they focus on just to compare and contrast, is you'll find SOC 2 is um, focused on uh, physical and logical security, and uh, in specific, you know, do you do what you say you'll do, 
whereas the ISO one is a little bit more uh, focused on risk. ISO is internationally recognized. SOC 2 has traditionally been more North American, but it is becoming more known internationally. Um, the purpose in the test for SOC 2 is that you achieve the um, standards associated with the control, but also that you implement your own policies and perform them. And uh, the ISO one is a little more focused on best practices. The ISO is managed by the ISO and ISO accredited agency would do the performance, would do the, the consulting and the certifying. Um, SOC 2 is almost always performed by CPA because it's governed and spec'd out by the AICPA. In the uh, difference about design and the, the nature of scope, as I said earlier, it, ISO is focusing on the design effectiveness or point in time, whereas the uh, SOC 2 will also look at operating effectiveness over a period of time. So type 2 would be 6 to 12 months, and, and it would look at the, how, how effective you were performing those functions over that entire period of time. You get a single page from an ISO certification. There's a detailed report that's considered confidential and internal. But otherwise, it's a uh, single page and doesn't provide a lot of detail to the to the reader or to your customer about what you're doing. In the case of SOC 2, you get a fairly detailed report. It can be many pages long. It describes the controls. It describes how they tested them. It describes the results of the testing. So it's very, very detailed and can provide a lot of insight for your customers and confidence to your customers that uh, of how you operate. Uh, I gain personal opinion. I consider the SOC 2 a higher degree of difficulty over the ISO because of that operating effectiveness component to it. So SOC 2, there's actually, no, I called it SOC 2, but there's actually three SOC reports, SOC 1, 2, and 3. The SOC 1, they're all used, they're all based on the same core set of controls, uh, but they subset it out and report out differently. So SOC 1 uses a subset of the controls and it's, and it's specifically is looking at situations where your system is being used for financial reporting. So if you are using your system to hold your sales ledger data, and you then are going to turn around and gen use that data to generate reports for your financial reporting, for your SEC filings, uh, things like that. So you will, um, so, so it's going to focus on a very specific subset of reports, and, and they're going to be slanting it towards that purpose of financial reporting. Not surprising when it comes from the AICPA. SOC 2 is a little more general, and it's going to look at more controls, uh, a superset of the ones that are looked at for SOC 1, uh, and they're looking at it for general purpose use. The report they produced is restricted because of the detail that is in there around the system, the security, the processes, the methodologies. Uh, if you achieve this for your environment, you would get a keep a copy of it yourself. You would only send it to clients or prospective clients under an, a non-disclosure agreement because of the level of detail in there. If it fell into the wrong hands, somebody could use that to try to mount a malicious attack. For people who do want to have something short and sweet and something you can put on your web page like the ISO certification, uh, there is a SOC 3 report. It is a, considered an executive summary of your SOC 2 and is used to um, provide, it provides the opinion and the description of the system, but it does not get into the details of the security practices or the testing methodology and results. So it's just a high level one. And so typically what you would do is you would commission at least a SOC 2. If you have the financial needs, you would also commission the SOC 1 and the SOC 3 would come uh, as well when you get into the type 2 situation. So you can do one audit and achieve all three certifications. Uh, you just need to plan that out with your auditor in advance. SOC 1, SOC 2 come in a type 1 and a type 2. You need to kind of keep a little chart. I'm going to have to make a little handy chart to keep track of these. But a type 1 report, consider that your starting line. That is the, uh, the closest equivalent to an ISO as well. So basically, it, it tests the design effectiveness of your controls and has tested that you have performed those controls at least once. So think of that as the start, type one. And you would use that when your product is new or when you are first acquiring your certification for SOC. It's not something you would ever repeat. You'd just do one type one report. After that, you move into a type two scenario. 
And the type two is now looking at operational effectiveness over a period of time. Typically that's six months or 12 months. And so you, um, the auditor will come in and they will test over the interval of that period of time. So if you're doing a six month test and they've come in after three months and run tests on the first three months and then come in at the end of the six months and then do some more tests. And basically they're looking that the control is operating effectively on day one, day 30, day 180, et cetera. Uh, the, the expectation there is that you're able to provide proof that you're maintaining your effectiveness of these controls over time. And typically you will renew them uh, either every six months or use them yearly. We do rolling 12 month reports typically in our business. So we would have uh, every six months, we would report out on the previous 12 months. This is very helpful for our customers who are looking at uh, using this for their businesses because they, they have continuity for the entire period uh, that they may be using our product. On top of the complexity of type ones and type twos and SOC ones and SOC twos, there are different principles or chapters within SOC two and they each come with a set of controls or requirements. The most typical and sort of the foundational one that everybody would get would be security. And they're looking specifically at how you're protecting your physical and logical access and uh, systems. So they have controls related to user provisioning, change management, inventory management, things like that. And uh, then we have other additional principles or chapters. And you can determine which ones are most relevant for your business and of course increase your uh, the scope the number of controls and the scope of your audits and the the reports uh, availability and confidentiality processing integrity and privacy uh, we're starting to see uh, we're definitely seeing availability and confidentiality and we're starting to see more interest in processing integrity and privacy as well so um, you can see the industry shifting from having kind of entry level securities baseline, we're gonna get that towards having these more complex and additional controls added on. Um, confidentiality and privacy is really useful as you also help to try to prove out your GDPR stance for your European customers. In this video, you will learn to describe the audit process for SOC reporting. When auditors are testing, as I said, they're looking at that continuity, they're testing for five main elements. And these elements are, um, they can be very particular. Right? This is, the SOC 2 is not for the faint of heart. It's a very challenging uh, compliance to achieve. So they're looking at accuracy. Are all the controls being addressed? Looking for passes and fails and very clear distinction about um, whether or not the control is being completed. Uh, completeness, do the control cover the entire offering? So, you know, if you're in case of a control looking at your systems, does it cover all your systems and all your inventory? If you're looking at access management, does it cover all personnel, all people? Looking at timeliness. Timeliness is a really big challenge for, for some teams, right? Making sure the controls are performed on time or early and that there's no gaps in coverage. So if you're supposed to apply your patches every week, you know, being a day late creates a gap in your coverage area that could potentially be a risk for um, a malicious attack or something inadvertent to go wrong. So they're looking at timeliness in particular. If for any reason that you're unable to perform a function on time, uh, there can be really logical reasons based on your customer's business needs that you would say, I'm gonna, you know, I, I've got a peak period going on here. I'm not gonna be patching during that peak period. So if the control can't be performed on time, have you done an appropriate risk assessment before the control is considered late? So if you were supposed to patch on Friday, but your customer calls and said, hey, we've got a promotion thing going on. I don't want to patch on Friday. I want to wait to Saturday. If you've got, if you've got an appropriate reason, you've looked at the business risk, you know the use case, you could say, hey, yeah, it's, it's safe to wait till Saturday. You need to have had that all documented in advance. Don't wait till Saturday to document it. Document it on Thursday so that you're not late. Um, resiliency, they're looking for checks and balances so that if a control did fail, was there, is there some secondary way that you can ensure that, that uh, something happened on time? And they're looking for consistency. So they want to ensure that there's no um, gaps introduced by, by having too much variability. So often they'll look at a primary control, they'll test the primary control, they're looking to ensure that you provide 
uh, features, functions of the control. If for any reason that's not working, they're looking for support or backup to ensure that the primary control is effective. So if you have access management uh, approvals records in place, are you periodically reconciling those approvals with what's live in your system to make sure that no one has circumvented your access management system and created an, uh, somehow an access account on the side, as an example? Uh, so this is a summary listing of the different controls that are used for audit. Uh, you can see they just could sort of break down into different chapters. These are chapters, by the way, that, that we use for our own purposes. You can go from the raw set of requirements from the AICPA. Uh, what's really important, regardless of which type of compliance you choose, whether it be ISO or SOC, uh, is continuous monitoring between your audits. Uh, we talked a lot about the different ways that you could potentially fail a SOC 2 audit, but you know, even for ISO audits that are point in time, you want to know that you have the um, controls operating as designed, that they are performing their functions, and that uh, all the communication is going out to whomever they need to go out to. You're looking to test your environment, your processes, and your people to ensure that the, uh, the continued execution of the controls. So we call that continuous monitoring. You're looking for uh, any risk of deviation, any um, time where you have a temporary failure or a delay. And uh, you'll want to try to identify those effectively because there's no point in having a standard if you're not making sure you're actually performing that standard. So this is an important aspect. In this video, you will learn to define the three rules established as standards for the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, HIPAA. Describe why HIPAA compliance is so important to an organization. Describe key HIPAA terms. I'm going to focus now on some more industry specific types of auditing. So the HIPAA or the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act is a US federal act for uh, healthcare information. The uh, note one P, two A's, it is a dead giveaway if somebody actually does two P's and an A that they are new to this process. So healthcare organizations are using cloud services to achieve savings and uh, scalability and, uh, and you know, there's a lot of concern about putting sensitive data in the cloud. Is that a good thing? Is that a risk? Well, that's why it's important to understand security and understand the, um, the provider that you're working with and making sure that they've understood that uh, this is important to ensure that we have the integrity in place to um, uh, provide the security and the safety and, and, and so on. But certainly our customers are looking at cloud more than ever to increase resource utilization, reduce costs, uh, increase response time. So HIPAA is the US federal law that um, identifies the control of personal healthcare information. So PHI, personal healthcare information. And uh, it's also related to the uh, other law in this space called high tech. The, um, the privacy rules associated with um, the HIPAA identify the right to an individual's medical records and uh, health information, and that it is accessed, again, very strictly accessed to those who need to know. It applies to health insurance companies, to healthcare providers, and anyone who might have access or need to share um, healthcare records. The security rule establishes a set of standards for protecting that data. And they must be in place for, um, for uh, both the covered entity and the uh, business associate, which are similar to what we would have, I'll define those in a minute, but they're similar to what we saw in GDPR. The, so the HIPAA is defined and managed and overseen by the US Department of Health and Human Services, the Office of Civil Rights. And they identify two main actors in this space. There's the covered entity. So this is the company that manages the healthcare data for the customer. So it would be a hospital. It would be an insurance company. It could be your doctor's office. 
A business associate is any vendor that supports the covered entity. So if you are providing an application, if you are providing a, a cloud environment to the hospital, to the, um, then you are a business associate of that covered entity. The protected health information is any information about the health status of the individual. And it is the responsibility of the covered entity or on their behalf or the business associate to ensure its uh, safety and confidentiality. Now, in the case of GDPR, we talked about large fines. There absolutely are large fines here for violations of HIPAA. There's also a wall of shame. You can go to the um, you can go to the uh, uh, website there, and they will produce that. Okay, so why is compliance here essential? So there are laws, uh, the U.S. federal laws, and they have teeth, and uh, they uh, the HHS will come in and do unannounced audit either on the BA or the uh, CE, so the covered entity or the business associate, one, the other, or both could find themselves under, uh, under uh, an audit situation. The fines can be in the millions of dollars. The, uh, you can face criminal prosecution, so serious stuff. So although it's a US regulation, the other thing to be aware of is that many other countries will have a similar law. We talked about GDPR. In Canada, there's the Personal Information Protection Environment Documents Act. So just about every geography is going to have a similar law or regulation on the books. Uh, many states in the U.S. will have even more strict laws or additional requirements that are laid out on top of the U.S. federal law for HIPAA. Uh, and so you need to be aware of that as you're choosing your jurisdictions you're doing business in and the types of compliances that you're um, aligning with. Some international companies will also require HIPAA, whether or not they, um, uh, they do business with U.S. data or U.S. customers or U.S. or they just see it as a valuable standard and they have confidence in it. So you'll see that being required in, internationally too. Okay, HIPAA security rules will cover uh, physical entities, uh, technical controls, administrative safeguards, all with that focus on protecting health information. Uh, they look at confidentiality, integrity, availability, and they want to ensure that we've taken all steps and actions to reasonably anticipate threats to uh, the security, integrity, and the information. Uh, you want to protect against um, impermissible uses, accidental disclosures, and ensure compliance by all of the workforce. Administrative safeguards, they take the, uh, they take the form of the, these are the non-technical or operational controls. They're looking at your management process, your personnel process. They'll look at hiring practices, workforce training, uh, background checks, um, things that you're doing to ensure the, um, uh, the integrity of the people and the processes they're performing. Technical safeguards, uh, again, like the general term, uh, technical, they're looking at access control, audit control, integrity control, transmission, uh, encryption at, odd, at rest, in transit, in use, um, different physical uh, controls to make sure, technical controls to make sure that the software is performing as it's expected. And then the physical safeguards are around the facility access, the, where the devices are. So if your data is stored on disk somewhere, where are those disks? Are they appropriately um, under access control and are they secure? They're also looking at access points, so workstation and device securities as they do it. So if you're in a hospital, think about all those uh, computers that are sitting on people's uh, desks out in the public area. The um, uh, workstation device security uh, is focused on all of those access points and making sure those access points are properly secured. Um, you know, timeouts on, on workstations, for example, to make sure that if you got up and left your workstation for um, an extended period of time, nobody could just swoop in and start using it. In this video, you will learn to describe the payment card industry data standard security, PCI DSS, Describe the goals and requirements of PCI DSS. 
describe the scope of PCI DSS as it relates to people, process, and technology. Highlight new and key requirements for PCI DSS. Payment card industry data security standards. So one of the things that you see quite a lot in the public space, and if you look at the you know, latest data breaches, it's around who gets access to somebody's credit cards. They're an incredibly high value target for uh, people who are looking for um, malicious access to your systems. So back in 2014, the uh, 2004 rather, the uh, set of high, um, the largest uh, credit card companies, American Express, Discovery, MasterCard, Visa, they banded together to define a standard for data security. This security standard gets revised periodically over the years as new standards and new um, technology become available. And uh, they require, these companies will require, if you're going to be engaged in any business that involves storage or transmission of credit card data, that you secure that data to these standards. So store, process, or transmit credit card holder data. That's credit card numbers, um, any of that sort of thing. The, it covers both technical and operational practices, so the administrative as well as the technical controls um, for the systems. And there are a total of 264 different individual requirements in 12 different groupings. So not if you're engaged in an audit for PCI, one of the first things they do, remember I talked earlier about defining scope, how many of these, two, what is the scope of your environment and how many of these 264 apply to you? So you'd go through the 12 different categories of these requirements from building and maintaining a secure network, protecting cardholder data, um, managing a, vulnerable, a vulnerability management program, access control, monitoring and testing your networks, and maintaining information security policy. You go through all of these different categories. You'll do an assessment. That's that whole readiness assessment that we talked about in the scope where you identify these different requirements and say how many of them are applicable to your environment. So, um, and, and they'll all do it in the context of understanding that the data that is at risk here, the data that they're protecting, is cardholder data. So cardholder data environment is the people, process, and technologies that store this. In particular, looking at the primary account number, or PAN data, and it can be the cardholder name, the expiry date, the service code, um, they're also looking at sensitive authentication data, so pins and pin blocks or uh, anything else that is used to authenticate a credit card transaction. And they're looking at, again, ensuring that anything that processes, transmits, or stores this data is considered, is considered in scope. So they're particularly looking at people, processes, and technologies. So they look at everything from your human resource aspect to this, to uh, network device management, uh, network seg segmentation, uh, audit logging. There's a number of different topics that we're going to look at here for this. And you can see as we're looking past over the last couple of requirements, they're all sort of similar and overlapping. Uh, and they just may each have individual um, unique slants. One of the things that's unique about PCI is they have this concept of an approved scanning vendor that scans quarterly, um, usually quarterly, and it's usually an external third policy. It's similar to, uh, it's similar but not the same as a vulnerability scan or the penetration testing you might see. Um, and, but it is a very specific and approved uh, nature and it's something that you're expected to perform uh, uniquely. One of the other things that we consider somewhat unique relative to other requirements are the uh, details around Nessus. There's particular configurations if you're doing scanning for vulnerability for Nessus and file integrity monitoring. File integrity monitoring is when you ensure that all the files that are running on your system are the ones that you intended to be there. And nobody's replaced an executable with a different executable, same name, uh, that's also performing. So they're, they're checking for skimmers as an example here. Uh, firewall uh, rule frequency, uh, review frequency is, is increased to six months. Some other certifications might only require it once a year. We've always taken something like this and said, if we want to make sure that it happens right at least once every six months, do it at least once every three months. 
then you have at least a couple times to do it. So you may want to do something more frequently than the spec requires to guarantee that you've got it achieved at least once during that interval. Automatic log offs during idle sessions are set at 15 minutes. Um, HIPAA, for example, is 30 minutes, so you can see some different things there. One of the things, one of the documents that gets produced from PCI is a responsibility matrix, and that's a really good document for you to review because it clarifies what are the responsibilities of the um, entity providing the PCI support and the consumer. So, in this case, when we talked about a hospital in a and a cloud application. In this case, we might be talking about a bank or a um, business that is using credit card, you know, has a web portal for purchasing, and you're storing those credit cards for uh, that purchasing arrangement. So that what you do and what your, what your consumers do is your responsibility matrix. In this video, you will learn to Describe the Center for Internet Security, CIS, Critical Security Controls. Describe the differences between basic, foundational, and organizational CIS controls. CIS is a set of security controls. Again, it's the Center for Internet Security. They produce a set of standards too. So you can get the theme here, right? Everybody's producing a list of standards of what's important to them. The Critical security controls are what the Inter Center for Internet Security believes are um, the set of in-depth best practices required to mitigate against systems and network, common attack systems and networks. So uh, in particular, we look, at, we, use, we look at their controls from a, a configuration perspective, right? How to best configure um, systems sitting on the public internet so that um, they are reasonably protected and we see a lot of uh, experts using these from retail, manufacturing, healthcare, across a wide variety of things. So the key difference between this sort of, so an example of a control here that is CIS governed is uh, say passwords. You're setting up a computer for the first time. You can choose to have passwords on, yes or no, right? Anybody with common sense is gonna say, yes, I want passwords. But if you want, you'll notice that when you use passwords at different sites, the complexity of the password could vary, right? Do I need eight characters? Do I need 15 characters? Do I need uppercase? Do I need lowercase? Do I need numbers and punctuation? Well, that's an example of a security configuration that each business will decide what is the appropriate configuration uh, that I'm going to do. And CIS has a set of configuration benchmarks. And one of the things they would govern, for example, is is password complexity. So we see a lot of different uh, basic foundational organizational controls in here, and I've just talked about a couple of uh, examples here around passwords, but you can see they cover a number of different topics, vulnerability management, um, boundary defense, um, application security, incident response and management. I haven't talked about that too much before, but let me take a minute and talk about incident management. It's one thing to say I've got all these controls in place and I have um, all these practices in place. But, you know, we talked earlier about security incidents. Something is going to go wrong or somebody is going to perceive that something has gone wrong. Who gets called? How do you know what to do about it? Do you have lifelines out there for your customers, for your employees to be able to call and say, I think I see something wrong. I have, think I see an incident and we need to respond to it. So uh, an, a protocol in your organization around incident management is an important part of most security postures. CIS breaks their, uh, their controls up into three implementation groups. They base them on the, uh, the maturity or the significance so, uh, of the controls and of the organizations using it. So if you're a mature uh, organization, um, enterprise, you're going to look at group three. Small, um, single storefront, maybe uh, group one is more appropriate to your business. Each of the controls is documented as to why you're doing the control, what the different parts are, what the tools and procedures would be, and uh, an example of how you would organize it.
So that concludes our talk on different types of controls. I've put a summary of different controls that we've talked about here at the end. And this is just a, a cheat sheet to kind of try to keep them all straight in your head. Um, wish you well in all your security and compliance activities. Thank you.